www.eatradio.com. Hello again, everybody. This is Joe Larson. You're watching the 505 on Racing Show. Happy New Year, 2017. Wow, it sounds so futuristic, but 2017 is here. 2016 is behind us. I'm so happy for that. 2017 can only be better, and I'll tell you what, it, it started off good for me. It's, it's all good. A lot of my buddies, and they're doing well, and, and, and it's, just, it's just a good thing. Daytona's in a, like six weeks. Racing will be here before you know it. And, and, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in racing. A lot of people don't understand that in the off season, whether you, it's the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup or the Xfinity Series or the Camper World Truck Series or a Weekly Series, there's a lot that goes on when that last race ends, no matter what series you're in. And, you know, it, it's one of the things that I learned on a job years ago is, you know, when does the wrap-up begin? It begins at the start of the job. And when does the start of the job begin? It becomes, begins after the wrap-up. So racing doesn't end for the promoters and for the, the engine builders and the car builders because the last check and flag dropped and the gates got locked. It, it's just, that's when it gets busy for them you know, getting ready for the following season. And, and in and talking to Tommy Ryan when I was down in North Carolina a couple of weeks ago, he said, you know, you got to stop building cars. It's, they're back in the shop today, getting cars ready for Daytona. And it's, to them, this is their peak. This is their crazy time. And, you know, they, they got to go look at the rule changes and see how it affects what they already have built, make some changes. And this is an insane period for the fabricators that work at the major places that go racing. And again, whether it's at the top level of racing or it's at the weekly level, you know, the rules, new rules are coming out, you know, from the weekly series tracks. And, and then, you know, these teams are looking for, what do I gotta do? And then a lot of changes, are, are, are they big changes? Are they little changes? What is it gonna cost me as, as a car owner, as a fabricator, what is it gonna cost me to follow these rules moving forward for the following season. And I was always a proponent of, you know, when it comes to rule changes, especially on the weekly level, where guys are on shoestring budgets and they're just trying to get by and, and they're doing this as a hobby, so to speak. I always wanted to have those changes for the, the teams the last night of the season or right before the holidays, you know, Rule changes aren't good. There, there are some weekly racing series tracks where the rule changes, not only do they come so late <laughs> that it's a problem, but the ones that make the rule changes mid-season. And a mid-season rule change is, is, just, is just not good for anybody. And there's a lot of work involved with changing rules. And you know, in some cases, you have to be a jailhouse lawyer to interpret these rules. But you know, it's a comma or a lack of a comma could change the whole interpretation of a rule. When you look at these rules, and again, a lot of the rules are interpreted, and, and that's on purpose, especially in the, in the higher levels of NASCAR, because you, you want to leave it to the discretion, or not we as competitors, but we as owners of racetracks and, and officials, you want to give yourself some wiggle room for interpretation. Even though the rule book is kind of black and white on a lot of the things, especially when it comes to safety and, and weight and cubic inch and things of that nature and gear ratios. But even there in gear ratios, I know in the modified tour, you know, your gear ratios, you, you have a full sometimes, full point if not more from the lowest gear to the highest gear. And, and when I, really it's not a point, it's a half a point or so. And, and when you look at that, you know, there's ways around that as well. And that was one of the things that, that I always questioned when I was a young guy growing up. I was brand new to racing, and I knew very little, very little. In fact, I knew less than when I first got involved with racing. And I can remember going to a meeting and we're talking about things, and, 
and I'm, my head's spinning because it's guys on each side of the room were saying stuff. And, and I remember, you know, talking about I had this race car that I just bought from a guy and and then somebody says to me, what, what gear ratio do you have? I go, oh, what's that? And he said, well, you know, your, your rear end, what's, what's the gear ratio? And, and I, I knew that because the guy told me. He says, I said, well, it's a 411. And the guy says, well, you sure it's not a 456? And no, it's a 411. So they said to me, well, with a 411 gear to run an ISA, you need to run 14-inch tires. But if you run a 456 gear, you need to run 15-inch tires. And I asked, why? Because, you know, I, I went to law school. I, you know, you got to know why. And, and the guy goes, because they always did it that way. I said, but there's got to be a reason or a logic. And nobody was able to explain that in, in a way I understood that. So I'm trying to do my homework. Now, you got to understand, this is, <laughs> this is a lifetime ago. This is 40 years ago. There was no internet. You couldn't go online and, and Google stuff. So I go to the library. And I go to the little tech section of automotive, and I'm getting out books, and I'm reading all this stuff. And, and all of a sudden, it hits me in looking at one of the books that that's just a part of the gear ratio. What gears are in your transmission? So I come to the next meeting. I'm all, I, I know what I'm talking about. And I says, well, depends on you know, what your gear ratio is in your transmission right? and what gear you're running in. And, you know, and that makes a whole big difference. And, and I said something about final drive. And everybody looked at me like, you don't know what you're talking about. Now we'll fast forward 10 years later, and, and I had gotten out, but come back in, and that's what everybody was talking about, final drive. Now I'm not saying I was ahead of myself, but I, I, I never accepted that paradigm as we do this because that's how it was always was done. I always checked that out and investigated. Now, it didn't do me any good, for those who know me. I, I wasn't up front, you know, battling for wins week after week. I was way in the back, just hanging on to finish. And I realized I was a better car owner than a driver, so I then put people in my cars, and we had some successes, and we had some wins, and, and, and we had some good times. But, you know, getting back to roots, I always go on little tangents, but getting back to rule change, Rule changes are never cheap. <laughs> They're always expensive. And I always questioned the integrity of rule changes. You know, who's better? I always said that when I, there's a rule change. We get an addendum when I was racing in a weekly series. Uh, we got an addendum effective next week. You have to have ABC. My first thing was, who came up with this? Who's going to benefit? And who tested it? And in some cases, you'd see, like, you know, the track favorite tested it. Or a guy who's supplying the track with stuff came up with the idea. And then, you know, it was, you got to buy this part, but it has to be installed by this guy. You have to take this off your car, but you have to add this part. And, and I remember just getting so frustrated over, over especially mid-season rule changes and, you know, the stuff that was going on and how the rule change would be, you know, you could have it today, but it's, you have to have it in two weeks. But if you have it now, that's okay. And a guy would roll into the track with this new part. How did he know about it before the memo was? Anyway, it's all good. But, you know, you, you look at those things and, and I look back and, you know, it, it's no different. It's no different when it was 40 years ago. It wasn't no different when it was 40 years beyond that. And, and the only rule changes that I'm, I'll fight to the death for is anything that has to do with additional safety. And, you know, when you look back, I, I, I was at the NASCAR Hall of Fame, and I looked at some of the old cars, and uh, I was, like, surprised that more drivers didn't get injured or hurt. And, and, and looking at how they didn't slide out of their seats, you know, and, and they only had a lap belt, and it was the stock bench seat that came in the car, and and, and even though you built it in, and you, 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 the rest of your body's going this way in, in the turn, and, and you're holding on to the steering wheel for dear life, and, and I wondered why, you know, and how more guys didn't get injured, and then when somebody did, unfortunately, oh, let's make a rule change, oh, we gotta make a rule change. You know, like, unfortunately, Dan McTavish, when he, uh, 
uh, lost his life at Daytona when he was in his horrific crash and, and the whole front end of the car got ripped off on impact from another car that even the, the dashboard was gone. And I remember seeing that as a, as a young kid on, on Wide World of Sports and, and he was just in his seat and you, know, you, you knew, you knew that uh, he had gone to a better place. And then a rule change came that you had to have the Grand National Bars, that, as they were called, because the thing happened in a Grand National event, and the bars went from the bumper to the uprights or the post to the roll cage. And it kind of helped that out. And over the years, that's progressed and become more sturdy and stronger, and, and there's flex points. But you know, you, you look at a lot of the rules over the years, and they, they, were, they became a rule because of something that might have been tragic or something that could have been tragic. And uh, you know those rules, they're all right. You tell me I gotta fix this or change this because it could hurt me if I don't, I'm all for it. But to tell me I gotta take a seat that's perfectly good and that you told me was safe up until now to go get another seat that costs, you know, by the time you're done over $3,000, I take issue with that. Who's benefiting from that? Was that other seat that bad that I had to go get this other seat for $3,500? I, I, don't, I don't know, you know? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just one of those things. And uh, hello, Tracy. No longer Tracy from Bethel, it's Tracy from Evans Mills. And, and, and as she says here in the chat room, if, if no one's car is legal to leave your track, then chances are no one else's car is legal to come into your track. And that's correct. And, and, I, and I believe in that. And, uh, and I know Tracy's up at the, the, her new venue as the uh, promoter up there and, and, and revamping her rules. And, and that was a 24 hour thing, just going through the rules. And you have to, and, and you have to go through each rule, and, and I know one of the things when, when I was in the weekly racing series as an official, I remember, like, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, you'd be on page eight and it would say, you must have blah, blah, blah. Then you flip through the pages on page 13 and said, you can never have blah, blah, blah. So as things were added, some things were never taken out. And, and, and one of the things that makes me laugh at a lot of these weekly racing series race tracks is, you know, it says the, the headliner must be removed. I don't know anybody who races a street stock or a late model or a pro stock or any type of full fended automobile that goes anymore to a junkyard and gets a body and, and has to take out the headliner. They're, they're buying these parts, they're buying bodies in, in, in a box, so to speak, and it gets delivered to them. Um, you know, guess some of the, I don't want to say lower divisions because that's, that's, that's not the right thing to say, but some of the, the less competitive con, um, divisions where they have uh, like, uh, it's a stock class, pure stock, strictly stock. Yeah, you might want to remove the headliner from, from those things. But uh, it, it's, you know, when you look at rules, it's just, it's just hard and, and I, don't, I don't know. It's not an easy thing to do, to go through the rules. You, you almost have to be an attorney to interpret it. And, uh, you know, and we're going to take a quick break, but one, one last thing. I, I can remember a competitor, a crew chief, coming in to my office, and we were having a discussion on a part that was questionable on their car. And, uh, and I said to this individual, I said, listen, that part, according to the rules, has to be factory stock. And he looked at me very seriously. He said, oh, Joe, uh, it was made in a factory. And when I went and ordered it, it was in stock. So that's factory stock. I had to rewrite that whole two sentences into almost a half a page. We're going to take a break. and we come back, we'll uh, talk about some of the things that went on over the last couple of weeks in racing at, at different levels when we come back. Hey, this is Chris Lust Dick, and if inravio.com spots you at an event wearing this bracelet, they will give you $100.
Village Music Shop of Mastic. 1-800-HEY-DUDE, your full service store with personalized attention, school band instrument rentals and sales, music instruction on all instruments for all styles and age groups, for guitars, drums, amplifiers, PA systems and accessories. It's Village Music Shop, 1495 Montauk Highway in Mastic. Call 1-800-HEY-DUDE or go to villagemusicshop.com. Hey, welcome back. Uh, just uh, perusing through the uh, chat room. And, and as Tracy said, you know, uh, saying like a crate motor is good because it came out of a crate. And you know, it, that's just some of the things that these guys say uh, when, you, when you're discussing rules with them. So anyway, uh, let's see what do we got going on. Martin Truex Jr. was named the 2016 Eastern Motorsports Press Association's National Driver of the Year. Um, and that's a kind of prestigious award. You know, the Eastern Motorsports Press Association is a big organization that has to do with uh, the racing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. And, you know, I, I, I read a lot of stuff that, uh, what do they, as they call themselves, EMPA. I read a lot of stuff that, that they write about. And, and uh, the gentleman who runs it, he also does a marketing thing as well. And, he, he tries to get sponsors for people and, and what you should and shouldn't do. And, and, uh, and he's another one that's big on appearance at banquets, you know, put the tie on, put the button down shirt, you know, look, look good, look, play the role and, and to make your sponsors happy. But uh, uh, congratulations to Martin Truex Jr. out of New Jersey. Uh, also, Todd Zegedy will be uh, returning full-time to the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour in 2017. Uh, Zegi will drive for a, a team which brings Kevin Stewart and longtime series owner Bobby Caton Jr. Uh, together. Uh, Zegi was the 2003 NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour champion. And from 2006 to 2012, Zegi finished in the top five each year driving full-time for Mike Slamurgo III, and uh, uh, what a team they had. They, they were awesome. And uh, in 2013, Zegedy finished sixth in the, in the points and parted ways uh, with the Bob Guy Reno you know, after driving the Mystic Missile. So Zegedy was back. I know Zegedy left the series to do things that he wanted to do, some family stuff and travel. And you know, it's, it's kind of funny when, and, and I'm gonna say this, and I'm not saying that this is the case in, in Todd's, Zegedy's uh, instance, but a lot of drivers who are used to winning don't wanna drive where they can't win. So instead of saying that, it's easy to say, oh, I'm gonna take a year off and, and rediscover myself. I'm gonna decompress. I'm gonna do things that I wanted to do during the races that I couldn't. And, and I think that's the case with a lot of drivers as they're looking for a new ride or a better ride. And, and, and I'll tell you what, Todd Zady is, is a gentleman and, um, when it comes to racing. And I can remember one of my first or second year, maybe as the race director, um, in post-race tech after winter race, Todd's gear ratio was, was off. And, and I think you were allowed to run like a, like a 461 to a 471, and he was like at four, 80. He wasn't in that range. And we had to go bring him in and his crew chief, Phil Moran, and bring him into the trail. And I'm, and I'm thinking of my Riverhead days where, you know, people want to threaten to kill you. You don't know what you're talking about. And, and they sat there and, and they apologized. They said, it's been X number of races since you've checked gear ratios. We thought we could have that little edge. And when you think about it, it's, it's a little edge. I mean, it's... It's not even a, you know, a tenth of a point. But they were gentlemen about it, and then they came back with the right ratios the following week, and, and they smoked the field again. So you know, they did their homework, and it was all good, so good. Uh, I, 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 wish, I wish Todd uh, well um, in, in 2017. Again, uh, uh, when it comes to being a competitor, he's, he's a true professional, and he, um, he's one of those guys that you want to watch come through the field. And you know, unfortunately with time trials, he's usually near the front, but you watch him come through the field, 
There's no beating and banging. There's no nerf ball to nerf bar. There's no shoving you out of the way. When he passes you, he passes you clean. When he races you, he races you hard. And uh, it's going to be good to see Todd uh, back full time in uh, 2017. Let's see, uh, the news that everybody has known about is Dale Earnhardt Jr. married Amy Reinhorn uh, on New Year's Eve, and his, the most eligible bachelor in NASCAR, is now married. And uh, it, it's, you, you looked at the pictures, and, and the guy looks happy. The guy looks genuinely happy. It looks like he'll be back in, in the seat at Hendrick Motorsports full time in 2017. He's been doing a lot of practicing, a lot of testing. Um, to make sure that he is, is ready for this. He's been cleared by all the doctors. He's been cleared by NASCAR. And, and you know, when you, you have that concussion thing, you know, I, I, my concern is he gets into one of those big bang up, boom ups, you know, the big one, as they say, where the cars go tumbling and everybody's hitting everything. You know, I, I wonder what precautions are gonna be taken with, with Dale Jr. Uh, to, to to protect his head from any further, you know, trauma. And, you know, the helmets, you know, the helmets are good, they protect you. But what happens is what's inside your skull is still bouncing around and it's banging against your, your, the skull. And, and, you know, when you have that, that concussion thing and it, and it cook you out, I mean, you know, I, I can only equate that to what happened to Pat LaFontaine on, on the island is with, with his concussions and it got to the point where he couldn't skate anymore. And, and, and he was told by doctors, one more shot to the head and you might be a vegetable. So I, and I, 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 I wish Dale Jr. the, the best and I, I hope health-wise it, it all works out for him. But my concern is, you know, everybody cleared him, but we all know there's a lot of politics that go on in, in NASCAR between the team owners and the sponsors and, you know, and you gotta go. It's like being a professional football player. You know, there's, there's no you're gonna miss the game because you're hurting, no. You, you, they tape it up, they shoot it up, and you, you, you go play the game. And, uh, and racing's no different, so. Uh, again, I, I wish him well, and, and uh, hopefully what was ailing him is behind him, you know? It's, we'll see. Ah, yes, 40 wins in the Sprint Cup, well, wow, in the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series. It's gonna take me a while to, to get that down. You know, only a handful of drivers have 40 wins or more. And uh, only 17 drivers, in fact, in NASCAR's top series have won 40 races. In 2017, three drivers have a shot at 40 wins. Kyle Busch, who was at 38 wins, Matt Kenzik, who was also at 38 wins, and Kevin Harvick, who was at 35 wins. 40 seems to be like that number, and then after 40, of course, there's 50. Now, you know, you look at the top 10 in wins here, and I'll go from the bottom up. Lee Petty had 54 wins. Uh, Rusty Wallace, 55. Then Dale Sr., 76. Jimmy Johnson, 80, still competing. Cale Yarbrough had 83. Dara Waltrip and Bobby Allison have 84 apiece, although Bobby Allison swears he has 85. Jeff Gordon, 93, seven wins shy of 100. David Pearson, uh, 105. And, of course, Richard Petty, 200 wins. I don't believe that anybody, anybody will surpass King Richard and that 200 wins. And I was looking at some stats today and back when they were running 50 races, 53 races, 48 races. You know, they were racing in some, sometimes three, four nights a week at different venues because it just mattered that you got points. It didn't matter where you raced. And as long as it was a grand national, as they put it back then, sanctioned event. And there was one year that Richard Petty won 27 events. I believe that was in 67. And that'll never happen again. That'll never happen. Competition is too tight. NASCAR has made the rules whereas nobody will have a competitive advantage. If Team A goes to their shop and they find this little tweak that's gonna make them that much faster, NASCAR is gonna do one of two things. They're gonna take that tweak away or give that tweak to everybody else. And they, and they will use the unfair competitive advantage, unapproved tweak to take it away from the team. And then don't be surprised, they're gonna go on to your R&D center, do this test, do this test, do this test, do that test, do the other test, and then everybody will get it. And uh, 
So I don't think anybody will surpass Richard Petty's 200. And uh, Jimmy Johnson is, a, is 20 wins away from 100. I don't think he'll get that. He would have to win on average you know, six races a year for the next, oh, I don't know, five years or so, doing the math real quick. And uh, I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know if Jimmy Johnson's going to still be racing in eight, nine, ten years. It's a whole different thing. Like when back in the, in, in the 60s and in the, in the 70s and even in the 50s, these guys, because they had worked their way up through the ranks and through the series, they were racing into their 40s and 50s and, and, and beyond. So when you, you look at the, these guys today, Jeff Gordon, a young guy, he retired. You know, Brian Scott, he wasn't even 30, he retired. You know, Rusty Wallace was a young guy when he retired. You know, and, and Rusty, had, you know, with, with 55 wins. Uh, Dale Senior, we all know what, what happened to him. His, his life was cut short racing. Who knows how many wins he would have had if he raced a couple of more years. But, uh, you know, you, you look at that. You know, Jimmy Johnson will, will definitely uh, be in the top five at the end of this season. Um, you know, with 80 wins, he'll, he'll pass Cale Yarbrough and then Darrell Waltrip and Bobby Allison. And, uh, and, and maybe in 2018, 2019, he'll pass his, his, his uh, rival and partner, you know, Jeff Gordon. Um, can, can Jimmy catch up to, to David Pearson? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I think it's just too competitive. And there's not a lot of pressure put on wins, although people are going to say, well, you got to win to get in the chase. So you, you got that one win, and now you're chasing points. And, and a lot of drivers now chase points, especially if they got that win that puts them in the chase at the end of the year. So it'll uh, be interesting to see how, uh, how that pans out. But, you know, it's, it's, I didn't realize that there was, you know, there was three guys that could get their 40th win this year. And well, yeah, this year it's 2017. And I said, well, it should be interesting to see. But, uh, you know, it's, and again, it's different too. And, and it's something I'm going to talk about in the second half is how many cars were, were starting events back in the 60s and the 70s. And, and the competition, there was a big spread between the best and the least best. That's an old UPS term because everybody was the best at UPS. But somebody had to be the best and somebody had to be the least best the bottom of the pile. And when, when you, you take a look back on that, you know, some of the guys, they just rode around. They just, you know, they, they made a couple of bucks that were, and they made some money, and just enough, as, as, as Bobby Allison had said to me one time we were talking, I was talking about the old days and him coming to ice up Speedway <laughs> back in the 60s, and, um, and, uh, and with a beat up, banged up car, wanting to know where the nearest junkyard was because he needed parts. Um, and I can remember him saying, you know, it was, it was a whole different ball game then. And you know, they started sometimes 50 cars in an event, and a lot of guys went home. But they, not that they went home, they went somewhere else to go racing to try to get some points. Because it was all about the points. How many points can we get? Let's get as many points as we can. Let's run this place. Let's go to that place. Let's run you know, this, this track today, this track tomorrow, this track the other day. And, and a lot of times, it, they didn't have you know, these they didn't have the big haulers. They didn't have the big crews. You know, they had a couple of guys that just hopped in the car and went with them. Because that's how they made their money. And, and, and they were hopeful to make just enough money to make it to the next race. And because they were racing for that, that point fund check at the end of the year. And not that it was a, that big back in those days, but it was enough sometimes to build a new car. It was enough to pay your winter bills. It was enough to keep your family together and, and keep, them, keep them fed and keep the heat on, you know. But when you, you look back and it was, it was a whole different era as opposed to what it is today. And, you know, back then, if you were good, you got the ride. Now, you can't just be good. You got to come with a, with a big check with you. You got to come with something. You got to bring something to the table. And I can remember you know, when, when I, my car was sitting, one of my race cars was sitting, and, and somebody called me up and he said, oh, I want to drive your car. I said, what do you bring to the table? He goes, excuse me, what do you mean? What do you bring to the table? Well, well you know, I, I, I'm this, I'm that. I, I don't. No, you need to bring something to the table. I'm not going to support your hobby. And, and, and I've said this a million times. I ran my race team like a business. I'm not going to take my business 
and support your hobby. You need to bring something to the table. And, and, and it was kind of funny. I had one, one driver that drove me. He only lasted one year with me. And, uh, and, and, and I'm going to say this, and I don't mean it in a disrespectful way. He was the worst driver I ever had. But he brought a lot to the table. I didn't go into my pocket once with this guy driving me. We kept the car. At his, his, his dad had a four-car garage. We kept the race car there. We kept the hauler. He had like a half an acre of property. We kept the, the, the trailer there. They brought it back and forth. One night a week, I went with a couple of guys. We did some work on it. But that's what he brought to the table. He brought the sponsorship package. And I already had decent sponsors, but he brought additional sponsors to the, to the, to the table. He brought the shop to the table. He brought the truck to the table. And that's what I mean by what do you bring into the table? And you need to bring something to the table. You need to bring something to the table. And, and when I look at some of the drivers on the Modified Tour and some of the car owners, and, and I ask some of these drivers, you know, how'd you get that ride? Well, it, it, you know, it cost me. And, and I'll, I'll use a guy that, that, that I know for a fact that this is what it cost. But I'm not going to use any names, the driver or the team. And he said, for the season, it cost me $200,000. I brought $200,000 to the, to the table to go racing. Another driver I was talking, how did you get that ride? Well, they needed a motor, and I have two. Considering that the motors and the modifiers are, you know, the non-spec engines were running around thirty-five to forty thousand. Technically, he brought eighty thousand dollars to the table. It was one car owner. I don't know who was talking. I said, "How do you with that guy?" Well, you know, I, I have my cars. I have my motors. Um, I have the hauler. I just needed somebody to pay the tire bill. So this this driver bought, or through his sponsorships or affiliates, you know, the, the ten tires a week. You know, fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars every event. You know, you do that math when you have, you know, fifteen races. That's a lot of money that he brought to the table. You got to bring something to the table. And like I said years ago, if you were good, you got the ride. And a lot of guys did their own thing. They built their own race cars. They they fixed them when they wrecked them. And that's what's missing today. That's what's missing today. And and I see this. I see. So many young drivers, young talent, and they are talented, don't get me wrong, that they wad the car up on, on this weekend, and they get out of the car, they brush themselves off, they take their helmet, they take their Hans device, and they go, all right, I'm going to catch the boat, or I'm going to catch the plane, or I'm going to catch something, i got to get home. And the next event, that car's all there, all shiny and pristine. And they go out and they do their thing, maybe they have a good finish, maybe they don't. They wad it up again. But you know, in between those wad ups, they have some good runs. And they brought something to the table. <laughs> so they're not going to lose their ride because if they lose their ride, whatever they brought to the table is going to come off the table. And like I said, I had that one driver, he wasn't that good. But he brought a lot of stuff to the table. And then I did, at one point, had a, had a real decent driver. And, and uh, he brought a little bit to the table, but what he was doing was making me look good in front of my sponsors. And if there was an appearance that had, that had to be done, he was there. If the car got a little messed up before the appearance, he made it happen to make it look good. He had some decent finishes, and, 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 and I'm, I'm not ashamed, it was Brian Cicella. And, and I, I was concerned when, and, and Brian, he's a Long Island race, he's driven just about everything but modifieds here on Long Island. Um, and him and his brother, they came as a package. And, and, and it was, I gotta tell you, it was the most fun I had racing was with those two guys. And you know, and, and any time I wanted to go play, I'd you know, take my cars out and practice and go have some fun with it. But when you, you look at that and, and you look at, again, the now, the then, and even what the future holds in racing, when you look at that, you, you see this, this whole, these young kids coming out that didn't, in my opinion, work their way through the ranks. All of a sudden, you, you know, you got these, you know, 17-year-olds in, 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 in uh, you know, NASCAR cup cars. And you have these guys. And, and I always thought that the, the Camper World Truck Series, when it first started, when it, when it first came to be, it was two things. It was for the guys who didn't want 
the grind and they couldn't get the big sponsor in the top series. So they went down to this truck series. They raced less, the cost was less, the travel was less in the beginning. But it was also where the new guy came, got his feet wet or her feet wet. And they, okay, they got some developmental skills and then they went up to the next level, which at the time was the Bush series, which is now the Xfinity series. And they hooked up with a team and you know, whether it was Joe Gibbs or Roush or Hendrick or whatever it was, Yates at the time. And then they got that ride as a fill-in. Hey, you know, we got an extra car, let's fill the field. Oh, we got, this guy's hurt, fill in for him. Oh, this guy, he's sick, he's gonna pit on lap, you know, 47 and you know, you're gonna hop in. And you know, when you, you looked at that stuff and it doesn't happen anymore. That's what the Camping World Truck Series, when, when it was, I guess, the True Value uh, Truck Series when it first started, that's what that was all about. And, and now it's become, you know, a test session <laughs> for some of the guys. And I'm glad NASCAR came out with that rule to make it so they were limited to what they could run. Because the truck series wasn't designed for the full-time Sprint Cup driver, nor was the Xfinity series designed for the full-time Sprint Cup driver. Those guys used those events when they're running at the same time. Track is just to feel the track, to run around. They don't get points. Yeah, they get the money, but they don't get the points. And, and I always felt they were taking points away from the regulars. They were always, that was always happening. And, and, and I never liked that. You know, and when it was the Bush series, they used to, when the cup guys used to run the Bush, they used to call them Bushwhackers. You know, they're coming in and, and taking those, those points away from the regulars. And you know what? I don't think that was the right thing to do. I mean, I believe in whoever shows up in, with the car and they can pass tech and they want to go racing, yeah, God bless them, go do it. But when you're at the top level, it's like, it'd be like Derek Jeter when he played for the Yankees saying, you know what, I'm, I'm off Thursday night. You know what, maybe I'll go play in the minor league, triple A. It doesn't work that way, it shouldn't, it shouldn't. Anyway, we're gonna take a break. We come back, uh, we're gonna talk about a little pre-NASCAR history and some of the stuff that went on back in the day when we come back. Hi, my name is Aaron from Real Big Fish. And I'm Ed from Real Big Fish. And you're watching the In Radio TV Network. Hey, I'm, I'm Raul Panther. And I'm Commander B. Hawkins. And I'm Marjuela. We're uh, some of the proto men. If we see you without this bracelet, we get punch in the d But if you have this bracelet from inradio.com, you can win 100 bucks. Put one of these on, or else. Village Music Shop of Master, 1-800-HEY-DUDE, your full-service store with personalized attention, school band instrument rentals and sales, music instruction on all instruments for all styles and age groups, for guitars, drums, amplifiers, PA systems, and accessories. It's Village Music Shop, 1495 Montauk Highway in Master. Call 1-800-HEY-DUDE or go to villagemusicshop.com. Welcome back. I like that shot. I don't know if it was paying attention that the modifieds going onto the tracker and that wall. And uh, I, I think that's just an awesome shot. And and that shot came from uh, Kevin Basic, Long Island Eve for Speed. I want to thank him for that um, because that's 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 a nice shot. But anyway, <laughs> I got to give credit what credit's due. You know what I mean? Um, you know, earlier I had mentioned you know like you know, these these guys like Bobby Allison coming to Iso Speedway, and. And a lot of people don't realize that ISO Speedway, as is Riverhead Raceway on Long Island, NASCAR trucks. You know, we're Long Islanders here. You know, and our show is from Long Island, and we shoot from Long Island, and, and, and I live on Long Island, and we cover racing all over the planet. But, you know, when, when I look back on the old stats and, you know, who was the, the top guys and where they raced, you know, and, and, and I just found some, some interesting information you know, at ISO Speedway. Uh, when the Grand National Cars, as they called them, ran there. And the first event at, at the ISO Speedway in ISO Long Island was held in 1964. Now, for those of you who never went there, it closed, I believe, in 82. So that was, you know, like 35 years ago, 34 years ago. And 
So if you're 35 or younger, you only heard of Isla Speedway. If you're 40, in that 35 to 40 range, you probably don't remember Isla Speedway. Well, Isla Speedway was, uh, was a normal Saturday night for me growing up. Uh, in my teens, more than when I was younger, um, I, I, my, my dad wasn't into racing, so you know, I, I can only get to the race when my grandfather would come pick me up and sneak me to the races with him. But anyway, the first Grand National event that was ever held at Isis Speedway uh, was in 1964, and it was won by a driver named Billy Wade with an average speed of 46.252 miles an hour, or as uh, my man Gravel used to say, he was... But he didn't like watching the modifieds at Riverhead because the average speed was in the 40s. And he'd rather sit on his front porch and watch them race on, you know, drive up and down Carlton Avenue at 60 miles an hour. Uh, but you know, these were grand national cars and their average speed was 46 miles an hour. And the way they come up with that, for those who don't know, the way they come up with that is they take the green flag dropped at this time, the checker flag dropped at this time, they went so many miles. How long did it take? That's the average speed. Now, the pole speed was 56 miles an hour. Now, now picture this, it was a fifth of a mile over. And I can remember going to one of the grand national events at Isis Speedway, and when they lined up the cars, it, it reminded me of the Enduros that I've seen on the short tracks like in the last 10 years. The leader was almost touching the last place guy or the last row before the green ever came out. But, um, but that, that's, that's when the first ones. And the last Grand National event that was held at Isis Speedway was in 1968, which was won by Bobby Allison with an average speed of 48.561 miles per hour. And I believe that is the race that I went to, and I'm going to tell you why I think that. I went to this race, and, and you know, to me, they were race cars, you know. I just happened to know the names from watching Wide World of Sports. You know, I knew Bobby Allison, not that I knew him, but knew of him, and Richard Petty, and David Pearson, and, and, and guys like that, Junior Johnson. And uh, I can remember Richard Petty was running away with the race. I, I, I'll never forget this. And there was a caution, and they had to stop. And they pitted on the, 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 the V part of the figure eight course, and that was pit road, so to speak. And I, and I can remember Richard Petty was, like I said, running away from it. Bobby Allison was second. And Bobby Allison allegedly tells Richard Petty he has a flat tire. Petty pits, loses laps, because he was laps ahead. And Bobby Allison goes on to win the race. So they go up to the press box or wherever they go to have this little talk. And I want to get their autographs. I'm there with a piece of paper. I want to get an autograph. And Bobby Allison's in there with, 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 with his crew chief or whoever. And he's doing the press thing for, the, at the time, the Long Island Press. Newsday wasn't big. Now Newsday's the only paper on Long Island. But there were a lot of papers on, on Long Island at the time. But the Long Island Press was covering the event. And Bobby Allison uh, was walking out of the... <laughs> he opens the door and he goes, all right, gentlemen, take care, see ya. And, and Maurice P Petty punches him right in the head, punches him right in the head. And, and they're, they're rolling on the floor, the, the Petty crew, the Allison guys, and then anybody else who wanted to punch somebody. And, and I was like, wow, I, I, I want to be a race car driver. <laughs> I want to do this. So, you know, you can punch people in the head and not have to worry about things. And, uh, and, and I was hooked that day. Now, I had gone to Freeport Municipal Stadium on, on Long Island and, and watched some of the races back as early as 1965. I'd been to ISOP a couple of times, you know, 67. But this one race, this, that event, and not the race itself, was <laughs> when Maurice Petty clocked Bobby Allison in the head when he came out of the press box. And, uh, and I remember that, and, and, and it made me a fan. It made me a fan of racing. And, and that's what's missing today. I know that sounds sick. That's what's missing today. There's no villains. There's no characters. There's no people that you, you, you want to root again, root for. And, you know, and, and, and NASCAR doesn't allow that. And, and the weekly places, they don't allow that either. 
And, and, and I know we had uh, John Wisconsin here uh, a month or so ago, and he was talking about back in the days when, when his dad, Cookie Wisconsin, and, and Paul Masiri in, in the late models at, at Freeport Speedway, and, and, and battling on the track and beating and banging each other for the wins. And, and it looked like they hated each other, but on Sunday they were having a barbecue at each other's houses. You know, because they were creating that, that aura for the fans. You know, and, and the, the divide, you know, who's for that guy and who's for this guy? And, you know, and they'd be cheering or they'd be booing. And that's what's missing. That's what's missing. And, and, and I saw on social media today, somebody said in social media that we, we need to get the 13 to 18 year olds involved because they're the future, you know, as he put it, future fans. Not only are they the future fans, they're possibly future drivers, future crew members. Maybe future hauler drivers, maybe in a future official. And when you, you look at that, you, you got to get this, the, these people involved. And, and I know, when, you know, I always felt when I first saw that Maurice Petty hit Bobby Allison, I always wanted, I ran down to the pits. Every time the features were over and the cars were going off the racetrack, I'd run down the fence, he was having a fight. Because there was always somebody fighting with somebody back in those days. Now you can't do that. You know, Especially in the weekly series, you get thrown out. You, you get thrown out for that, and, and, and sometimes you get thrown out and you're asked not to come back. Now, car counts are already low in a lot of the weekly series, a lot of them. You could throw people out when you have 50 cars in a division or 40 cars in a division. When you have 12 or 20, you can't throw people out. It's just my opinion. So how do you make these characters where they're not getting thrown out? You know, yeah, you know, I know they make the rule now, you can't get out of your car, you can get thrown out forever, you know, it's a big rule. But think about, think about, you're watching a race, you're sitting in the grandstand, and two guys get into it, they have a wreck, and, and the one guy, you know, gets out of his wrecked race cars, the other guy drives away, and, and he pulls down a window net and he has a discussion with him. That's a fine, maybe even a suspension. They go running across the track, the fans are going wild. They missed that. They missed that. I, I, I think that's the greatest thing. You don't want to see them pounding on each other and fighting, but you know, let them do that stuff. I don't know. That's a, just my opinion. Because you know, the fans go wild, especially you know, if my guy got wrecked and he and he gets out of his wrecked race car and he runs across the track to go talk to the other guy. I, I want him to do that. I want him to do that. Maybe you know, it's 2017. We could do that stuff again. You know. And, and, and I can remember years ago, I, I was in a wreck, and it was my fault. Imagine that. And uh, <laughs> I got out of my race car, and I ran across the racetrack to the guy that I wrecked with. Well, it, it looked like he wrecked me, but I really wrecked myself. You know, but, and the people were going wild. They thought there was going to brouhaha. And I went over, and I says, you all right? You got a pit? You need anything? Because <laughs> I'm done. I got stuff you need. It. And the fans think there's going to be a big fight. We're talking through the window net, and because the engines are running, you got to talk loud. And you, I was very animated. I was like, ah. I wasn't looking to have no fight. I, I did that in dark corners where nobody could watch, you know, <laughs> back in the day. But, you know, and, and, and like I said, back in the day, you know, I have a little thing about where, where NASCAR evolved from. And, you know, you look back, and everybody says the modifieds were the NASCAR first division. And they were. You know, when NASCAR became officially NASCAR in 1948, their first division were called Modifieds. Because the drivers and the owners and the teams, they went to the local car dealership, took a car off the lot, brand new, and they modified it. That was the top series. It was only for one year because in 1949, they called them Strictly Stocks because some of these guys were getting a little carried away and making some major changes and they were rewriting the rebook almost every week. So they called them strictly stocks. And then in 1950, NASCAR called them Grand Nationals. They were Grand National cars for 21 years. Grand Nationals. And I can remember watching that movie with Richard Pryor called uh, Grease Lightning where he was uh, about Wendell Scott the first African-American driver to win an event, which was at Jacksonville um, Speedway. And when, when, when I, I looked at this, you know, I, I can remember a scene where, because you know, he was out of racing for a long time due to a horrific crash, and he walked into the local pool hall, and 
his former crew chief is in there talking to, the, to these young guys about this guy and how good he was and blah, 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 and, 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 and how they ain't seen him in a long time. And, and one of the young guys says, well, where's this guy today? And before his crew chief could say anything, Wendell Scott allegedly says, uh, he entered the Grand National this morning. Because I, he entered the Grand National this morning? And I can remember his crew chief going, you, you got a car? No. Got a crew? No. What do you got? Heart? He goes, we're back in business, and they went racing. And, and you did that back then, you know, but the Grand Nationals. Everybody knew what a Grand National car was. Then in 1971, they go corporate. R.J. Reynolds, through their Winston brand, sponsors the series and becomes the Winston Cup. They actually call that the modern era, where the schedule was a little less. They, did, they weren't racing all over the place. It was pretty concentrated. Maybe they had a the Riverside out in the, on the West Coast, Michigan. It, it was, a, it was a, a new era in, in racing, and it stayed that way for over 30 years, the Winston Cup. And then next up came into being, 2004, became the Nextel Cup. Well, Nextel and Sprint merge, and what they did was they called it the Sprint Cup. And Sprint came into play in the Sprint Cup in, in 2007. And then we know now for 2017, we have uh, the Monster Energy Series NASCAR Cup. So it's evolved over the years. Now, we don't know how long Monster Energy is going to be around. I, I don't think we'll ever see a, a sponsor like R.J. Reynolds with the Winston brand ever again in this, this sport. Who knows? Never say never, as they say. And, and the Sprint Cup was around for a long time. And, and you have to understand that there's a return on that big investment. I don't know how much they paid. It was reported that Sprint paid $75 million for that title deal. But, you know, when you, you think about it, every official had to have a Sprint Cup or a Sprint phone. Every person that was involved with NASCAR had a Sprint phone. There was Sprint signs and towers all over the race yards. The, the brand was there. It was on the TV, and, and there were people, there were marketing people that keep track of how long was that logo on TV? Because that equates to, to advertising dollars. What did they not have to pay to get that? You know, so when you look at that, um, it, it's going to be interesting what, what the Monster Energy uh, brand does for NASCAR moving forward, and I think it's, it's a good thing. And in a moment, it's, it's a way to entice the young fan. It was all... Who drinks Monster Energy drink? It's mostly young people. The young people that drink a Monster Energy drink. It's a way to get them to get into racing because race fans are brand loyal. If your favorite driver is sponsored by, you know, Acme Cola, all of a sudden you're going to go to the store and get Acme Cola. And if they don't have it, you're going to ask them to get it. And that's just you in your neighborhood. What about across the planet, you know? So I think this is a good thing for NASCAR. I think the change was needed. Um, again, there'll never be a sponsor like Winston and, and R.J. Reynolds through the Winston brand, so it's all good. But, you know, you look back, you know, racing didn't start in 1948 with NASCAR. It didn't start in that way. It started at the turn of, the, well, two, turn of two centuries ago in, in the early 1900s. Remember, the, the first racetrack ever was on Long Island. The Vanderbilt Cup. Almost, they went from Queens, which was in a borough of New York, to Lake Ronkonkoma. They made a lap around the, tra the, the lake and went back to Queens on a track which became a toll road, the Vanderbilt Motor Parkway, which is still in existence most of the way. But in 19 so 1903, the first organized speed tournaments were held at the Daytona Beach, Florida. Uh, area in Ormond Beach, where Alexander Winton blisters the hard-packed sands at 68.19 miles per hour. I, I, you're looking at 1903. The, you could run faster than cars were driving back in those days. So what you, you, to go 68 miles, I know that was that was hauling. Then in March of 1935, Sir Malcolm Campbell drove a five-ton what they called Bluebird at a speed of 276.82 miles per hour, a record at the time, and this would be the last speed trial on the Daytona Beach shoreline, the measured mile, as they called it. And there's signs along A1A that show that. March 1936, Daytona Beach officials uh, uh, 
break a 240 mile late model stock car race to replace the speed trials. Milt Marion wins and a relative unknown named Bill France finished fifth. And if you caught the beginning of that, Daytona Beach officials, not race officials, the Daytona Beach officials, the board, the town board, the village board, whatever it was back then, said, wait a minute, that brought a lot of people here. We need to have a race. They conducted that race. They promoted it. And you know what? That's, again, what's missing from racing today is everybody wants to be so politically correct. So if a guy who builds or buys a house next to a racetrack that's been there for 50 years and he's there five weeks, he goes to the town, oh, I want that racetrack closed. And the town is, oh, 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 oh I don't want to lose this guy. Oh, oh. You know? The community, the officials of the community made that race happen. September 1939, Roy Hall, a known moonshiner, drives a Ford to victory in a 150 lap race on the dirt track in Salisbury, North Carolina. A relative unknown named Bill France finished second. In 1940, March of 1940, Ray Hall in a Ford wins a 160 mile stock car race on a Daytona Beach Road course. In July of that same year, Bill France drives the victory in a 200 mile event, filling in for Ray Hall, who, by the way, is in jail for a moonshine charge. And in 1947, Bill France announces the formation of the National Championship Stock Car Circuit, a touring series for stock car jockeys, as they were called. Now France approaches the American Automobile Association, which was known as the AAA back then, to include stock car racing in AAA sanctioned events, which primarily were open wheel cars back then. The AAA told France to get lost, telling France, and I quote, stock car racing would, yeah, stock car racing would never make a viable branch of motorsports. France was a visionary. 1947, France and 40, had 40 events starting in Daytona Beach and concluding in Jacksonville, Florida with his new series. Truman Fontello Flock, also known as Fonti, you may know him as Fonti Flock, was the NCSCC champion. On December 14, 1947, meetings began at the Starlight Hotel with 35 men and they formed NASCAR. At that meeting, when they formed NASCAR, they decided to include Fonte Funk as his new, as their new and first champion. Kind of like now, you know, like last year they were the Sprint Cup champions and people who won it under Grand National and Winston Cup and Nexo Cup are considered former Sprint Cup champions. Fonte Flock was a NASCAR champion, Grand National champion. Then on February 15, 1948, Red Byron wins the first NASCAR sanctioned event in a 1939 modified Ford. 1939 Ford in a 1948 race. 62 cars entered the event, 50 took the green, and fans paid $2.50 to watch the historic event at the Daytona Beach Road Course. Now you're gonna say, wow, $2.50. Now considering minimum wage was like 25 cents an hour in 1948, if I'm not mistaken, that was like a day's pay. Everything's relative. Think about it. you go to these races today, you spend a lot of money going. On February 21st, 1948, NASCAR incorporates because they had that first race on the 15th and the lawyer said, you know, if something happens, you get sued. You're going to lose everything. They incorporated. And in 1948, NASCAR modified champion Red Byron was their first NASCAR champion. 34 starts, 11 wins with 25 top fives. Little NASCAR history. I'm going to, in the off season, be throwing stuff like that at you on occasion. Anyway, it looks like it's that time to wrap up. So I want to thank everybody for being a part of the show tonight. 2017 is here upon us. I wish everybody the best in 2017. 
and the best in your future and whatever and wherever you may be going this week until our next show, please be safe. Please be careful. God bless you all. It's been a pleasure tonight. Happy New Year. We'll see you next time. And don't forget to give somebody a hug and tell them you love them. Good night, everybody.